Hi everyone, my name is Omar. Um, I currently work at NeoWise doing really cool things with machine learning, which has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about for the next 30 minutes. We're going to talk about using Markov chains, which we'll talk a little bit about what they are, in order to simulate text. So we're going to do, take texts like uh, Robert Frost or Lord of the Rings, we're going to look at that text and create texts that are generally pretty much nonsense, but sound like they might have been a poem by Robert Frost or a part of Lord of the Rings. Um, just to sort of understand more or less what we're going to do, we're not going to show the state-of-the-art things that you can do in order to simulate text. If you want to do that, you need to study NLP. It's a little bit more complicated, and by that I mean way, way, way more complicated than what we're going to do here, and absolutely can't be shown from, one, from start to end in a 30-minute presentation. What we're going to do here is going to be a considerably simpler way to do it. It's still going to be fun looking at the results. Uh, and the nice thing about it is that you can, in fact, I did program the whole thing start to end with a clean Python in under 15 minutes. Uh, if you're faster than me, you can probably do it in less. Uh, it's going to be 27 lines of code. Uh, could probably be taken down to 15 if you take away things that I put in there for readability. Um, and that's probably the nicest thing about it. You can just put it up, do it very quickly, and then play around with it and see the results, which are actually pretty cool. Robert Frost is a really, really great poet. If you don't like poetry, I would suggest trying him out just to start and see if it's interesting. He's probably one of the most interesting ones. You may have heard of poems like The Road Not Taken, Fire and Ice, uh, A Boy's Will, I think, is a story. He's actually really good. And if you would like to create Robert Frost poems on your own, most of you are probably thinking, the best thing to do would be to kidnap Robert Frost, lock him up in a room, feed him once a day, and only give him treats if he writes poetry. That is probably, I mean, I'm assuming you all are kind of thinking, yeah, this is what we would do, that would be the best way to create lots of new Robert Frost poetry. The thing is there are like quite a lot of difficult issues with doing that, right? So, so flights of the US are expensive, there are like genuine ethical issues with kidnapping people, uh, and he, he died in 1963, which, again, would make doing this considerably more work than 15 minutes of Python. So we're going to put this solution aside and look at a new solution, which is let's try to figure out a model to sort of model what we think Robert Frost's poems are like. If we understand this model well enough, we can use this model in order to generate more text. And the simplest model that we'll look at is let's just look at words by their probability in Robert Frost's poems. So what we're going to do is very simple. This is version one, right? We're going to do something slightly more complicated than that. But what we're going to do is just going to take lots of Robert Frost poems. I think I used about 20. Um, put them all into a huge text file and count the number of times each word appeared, right? So we'll get something like what you see on the screen on the bottom right-hand side. And you'll get the word the has been used about 4.5% of the time, the word to about 3.5% of the time. I, about 2%, A of, and that keeps going and eventually gets to actually interesting words, right? Because things do happen in those poems and not just like random connecting words between different things. And what this means is that we now have a very silly model for what poetry is, right? When a poet, according to this model, is trying to write poetry, what that poet does is this thing. They sit next to a blank piece of paper and then say, well, what's the next word I'm going to write? And then just goes to that table that we have the beginning of on the bottom right hand and just throws lots of dice or uses Python random or whatever it is that they want and decides on a word, writes that down on the piece of paper and then does this whole thing over and over and over again until they feel like they're done. And then we get poems. We get pretty cool poems sometimes. So I just used this very simple method to create a Robert Frost poem, right? So what I did is, I took all the words, counted each one, got the probabilities, randomized words, and we get a poem, okay? Uh, the beautiful thing about poetry is that it doesn't matter how nonsensical this is, you can't tell me this isn't poetry. This is art, this is my art. If you say this is bad, then you are now offensive. So my version one Robert Frost poem is this. Had deeper to and felt my rest, with the code remain him wasted grief. Go different on down the me, a on his I the, hold she to face hold his. Okay, this is this is deep as you can you can probably see. The issue is that this still feels kind of stupid. Okay, I'm allowed to say it because I wrote it. 
they still feel kind of stupid. And, and the main reason is stupid is actually quite obvious, because every time a word was decided to be put down into my poem, it had nothing to do with the context or with what we had done up until then. There's no state to this poem, right? Just completely randomizing words by some sort of probability. And so what we need is something that, to some extent, remember what I've been writing up until now, and then decides on the next word, because it's going to work like that, or we're going to go in some sort of loop and sort of decide what will the next word be, what will the next word be. But when I decide this next word, we have to have some sort of memory of what we've done until, until now, so we have some sort of context. And that's what we want. So we're going to find a model that is, on the one hand, gives me something that at least feels like poetry. It's still not going to actually make sense and have a real context and, and have any meaning that we don't just imagine or invent that it'll have. So, uh, not unlike some real poets. Um, and it also must be very, very simple, because what we want to do here is show you something that you can just take on a Python interpreter, program it very quickly, and then play around with it and see what happens when you not only try poetry, but maybe try to put the text from the Bible in there and see what it li what looks like nonsensical text from the Bible, or Lord of the Rings, and see what like random Lord of the Rings uh, text looks like. So we want something quick, quick and easy, and that's the main thing. And what we're going to use is Python chains. Python chains are actually a relatively cool concept, which we won't explain end to end, but at least explain what it means in this context. Usually when we talk about generating text or models for text, we're going to have two stages. The first one is called training, which is let's look at a lot of text and learn what it's like, and then there's generation. We'll create new text in that way. In the very, very simple thing we've done until now, the training was let's count how many times every word appeared and let's just remember the probability. And then the generation was just randomize it. When we look at Python chains, we're not going to look at, in general, how many times every word appeared, but we're going to learn and look at how many times every word appeared after the few words that came before it. So we're going to look at, say, let's look after the word the, and let's look at all of the words that have appeared after the word the, there will be the barn, the north, the person, right? And just see, after the word the, what appears and what are their probabilities? After the word on, probably the most common one will be on the, but there's also on myself or on him. So we're going to look at, after every word, what are the words that came afterwards? But we don't only have to look at given one word that we remember. We might want to remember two words or three words or 10 words. That's called the order of the Markov chain. So when a Markov chain of order two would mean at every point I look at two words, on the, for instance, just easy common words, and let's look at the words after that. So if we have a Markov chain of order one, that means at every point we'll look at single words and ask which words came after them. If we have a Markov chain of order two, we'll look at two words and ask what are the probabilities for words after those two words. A Markov chain of order zero will be exactly what we've done up until now. We remember nothing of the past and just ask what the next word is. If we want to train a Markov model of, say, order two, we will go over all of the text that we have, look at triplets of words, look at the first two words, and then ask what this next word is, and then go one word forward, these two words, this is the word that came out. These two words, one word that came out. One by one over all of them. And then we'll sum that up together, and after every two words, we will have the probabilities of the next word in line. That's Markov chain of order two. So let's actually look at the code that we have in order to make this work. The whole thing will be 27 lines of code. Um, some things there are like superfluous, and we could probably do it in 15 without losing a lot. I am actually starting to think that it may genuinely be possible to do the whole thing in one line of code if you're one of the people who likes doing those kind of things in Python. If you do have that particular fetish and send me that one line of code, I promise to give you credit next time. Uh, we're going to have a class called Markov, which will have three methods, the init method, which will have nothing pretty much in it, a uh, train method, which will get text and then learn from that text, and then the generate method, which will create random text. Let's look at the init. Um, it's actually pretty silly and there's nothing there. So it receives the order because we need to know ahead of time how far back we want to remember everything. So it'll be just a number, zero, one, two, five. Generally with text, you'll probably want an order of one, two, or three. Um, more than that, you'll have some issues because you won't have a long enough text. But if you do have a huge amount of text, you can probably do higher orders than that. Um, order zero means just what we did up until now. Group size is just, if we have an order two, so we're looking at 
groups of three words at a time. It's just easier and makes it more readable later. So that's order plus one. And then we'll have text, which will have all the words in the text, and graph, which will hold the information that we've learned. The reason it's called a graph is because it is a graph, though we won't be looking at it like one here at all, uh, but it's still called graph here. That's because it's more, com more easier to think of it that way, I think. The train function, as I remember, will just receive a file that is a text file that has lots and lots and lots of text, hopefully, and we'll save the information that we need in order to generate text later. So the first thing is we'll actually want to just get the text, right? So the first line is just read the file, split it up into words. Um, the second part is really quite uninteresting, but what we do is we take the beginning of the text and tack it onto the end. It's really only so that there isn't a part of the text that I don't know what can come afterwards. That's the only reason. I don't want the end of the text to be like, I want to generate text that comes after this word, but I've never seen anything coming after this word because the file has ended. So we just add the beginning onto the end so that it's circular in a way. Uh, but this is really uninteresting. If that confuses you, then just forget about it. Then we go one by one over the text, and every time we do, the key will be the few words that came before this next word that we're looking at, and the value will be the word that comes up now. Right? So we'll look at, let's imagine that we're talking about a Markov chain of order two, so we will be looking at groups of three words at a time. The first two words will be the key, and the value will be the word that came after that. So we look at on the, and the next word was barn, and then we understand the key is on the, and the value is barn. And we save that. If we've seen this in the past, we just add this word onto the end, and if we didn't see this in the past, then we just add it here. At the end of running all of this code, and this should be relatively clear to you guys, we will have graph, which is a dictionary, the keys in that dictionary will be, assuming we're looking at order two, pairs of words, and the value in the dictionary for a specific pair of words will be the list of all the words that we've seen come after this pair of words in our text. It's not, we didn't shorten it in any way, we didn't count the words, we just put them all in there. So if a word appeared five times, it'll just appear five times in that list. Like the absolute simplest way to do it, no work whatsoever. Every two words, what are all the words that ever came after these two words? That's it. That's all we need. Obviously, if we want to do something that works faster, for instance, we'll do some considerably more interesting work, but this is just absolute plain. Save all the data. And now we can generate a text. And we will get the length of the text we want to generate. So I tell them I want 30 words or I want 100 words. What we have saved until now is how do we create words after we've seen some words? But I don't know how to generate words if I did, don't have any sort of start yet. So I'm going to cheat. I'm just going to take a random place within the text and start there. So if my order is two, I'm just going to choose random place in the text, take two words from that text, and keep generating on from there. I'm not eventually going to return these words. I'm going to cut them off and throw them away and just return the words that I generated. But in order to have something to start with, I'm going to cheat and just take a random place. So that's what we do. So index is just going to be a random place within the text, and the result, which is the string that I'll create with all of the, it's, it's a, right now it's a list, it'll be a string that I create with all of the words that I want, will just go to the text, to that index, and take order words, in our case, two words from that text. And now I just loop throughout the length of text that I want to create. If I want to create a text of 100 words, I'll just loop to 100. And every time I will say, the current state of the text is the last words, Right? So just take the result and take the last few words in that result. That is the state that we are in right now. The next word will be randomly choosing from the graph the next word from the words that appeared after those words. So it'll happen with the probabilities they appeared in the text because the word will appear in the value as many times as we've seen in the text. And just add it onto the result. That's it. And I do that over and over and over and over again, and I get lots of words. And it keeps going. It keeps on going up next and so on. And then I return it. And like, this is it. I need to say something that is quite important about what this does and what this can do, and more importantly, what this doesn't do. Because this being so simple is really cool. It allows us to, and we'll see in a second, results that this gives on lots of sort of different types of inputs and different orders, so you get an intuition as to what sort of things this does. But it doesn't do a whole lot of things that you'd really want to do if you were doing this for anything other than fun, okay? So one thing is, it genuinely isn't the best or state-of-the-art algorithms that there are, but even for Markov chains, there are a few things that we didn't deal with at all. So one thing, we didn't deal with punctuation at all, right? I mean, we, we've ignored the fact that punctuation exists. So what this does right now is, if I have the word, say, ball, and the word ball with a period afterwards, because it's the last word in the sentence, those are now two completely different words. 
that does do some weird things. Now, it's okay, right? It still gives us something, because if those words appear after other words, we might choose them, and then we might end the sentence or not end the sentence. It doesn't create text that don't make sense at all, but it's not, it doesn't use all of the information that we get. But you can see things like end of sentences, like two words apart and things like that. You can see weird things because you don't deal with punctuation at all. So that's one thing that this doesn't do. Second thing is, we didn't talk at all about cleaning our input texts. So we'll get texts from anywhere from the internet, and usually we'll have to do a little bit of work on those texts before we can input them in. Um, to be fair, the input texts I use here were pretty much not cleaned at all. So poetry usually had like numbers in the beginning of lines, so I removed those, but I pretty much didn't touch anything else. Uh, just in order that you'll get results like of, of just this without any more work. But usually you'll want to do some cleaning up of texts. Third thing, and that's really important before we actually go to the results, and talking a little bit about order. And the thing about order is, we've seen a result of order zero, that's random words in the right probability. Order one, if we think about it intuitively, every word that we create remembers one word back, right? Remembers one thing that we didn't do up until now. You'll definitely get sentences that don't make sense, because if you only remember one word back, you'll get very, very strange things. Uh, but you will get something that, at the very least, doesn't look like the, the fourth sentence in here, right? You won't get a -o on his I the. You won't get that, but you'll definitely make some, get some sentences that absolutely don't make sense. Order two and three already start to look like actual texts. Um, you'll get more weird things in order two than three, but you'll actually get things that resemble sentences, and they're actually pretty cool. And then it'll get things that start seeming like they might be somewhat intelligent. The interesting thing is, there is an issue with going to higher and higher orders. The main issue with going to higher and higher orders is that you need more text in order for it to work. Now, just as sort of a small mental exercise, if we use this exact method, but we're using too high of an order, that is, we're using an order of four or five when you don't have enough text to back that up, then we can think for a second what would actually happen, what would the text look like? And you can try to see if you've got the intuition to see what would happen if we do that. But what would actually happen is that we just start quoting parts from the text. Because if I, at any point, I remember four or five words back, and those four or five words only appeared once in the text, then I'll definitely move on to the next word. And now I look four or five words back, but this still only happened one time ever. And so we'll move on to the next word. So if we're using too high an order, we'll just start quoting the text, which is not interesting at all. So you need to make sure to have a low enough order that you have choice in your randomness at every point. Or not at every point, but at least at quite a lot of points. And if you, do, if you don't do that, then you'll start quoting, which is absolutely uninteresting. So let's see what happens. Let's actually try to see some results. If we look at a Robert Frost poem of order one, then we get something like this. One way you had in a week can cure me up bodily, chair and through, high and just, such as my strength put it, opened with a whipstock. Okay, that, that, that's some, I, I added the uh, uh, new lines, so, so the splitting into lines is, is me, that's not the computer, but the rest of it is, is the computer. We can do order two, but that's about as high as we can go with Robert Frost. And we get two clear water, one drop fell from a fern, and lo, a ripple shook whatever it was all about. There might be something he had in mind to say. Okay, and this actually sounds like a poem. Like, like to be fair, not knowing anything at all about poetry, this sounds a little bit like a poem. Uh, I, I would have trouble discerning this from uh, poems made by people I don't like. Okay, so, 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 so this is, this is uh, not completely bad. I'm, I'm quite sure that if you rounded up a lot of poetry, you could do three and four, and that would actually, like, I'm wondering at what point it would be, like, actually not discernible. It would be difficult with Markov model. You probably need something a little bit better. But then I went on and tried some more, some more things. So, so the next thing is, uh, let's try taking all of Lord of the Rings uh, and creating a order one Markov simulation, right? And that's not going to make a lot of sense, right? So we get, they must carry off that all that, right? Because we only remember one word back, so that all that can, can happen. Said Legolas, I stole. But the crossroads touching Gandalf's eyes first, as if reason Mithrandir never felt that was standing on the valor has come to see the ring or in Rivendell. Right? So, so it only numbers one word back, and that's actually genuinely difficult to create context with. Order two Lord of the Rings gives us something like this. The ruffians had clubs in their houses, unless you should still be sitting here. When spring had passed into Nan Coronir, the wizard's veil, vale, I think. But I see as much ale as was possible on such. A chase as shall be moving this autumn, he said. 
Okay, and that's like again not bad, right? It's it's you can't read this, uh, but it's it's definitely not bad. Um, somebody who has very very low, uh, like low opinion of, of, of fantasy books might might think this makes sense. Order three is as high as I can go with Lord of the Rings, um, and we'll start quoting sometimes three, four, five group words. Uh, sometimes usually it won't. Usually it'll have two or three words and then move to somewhere else. Uh, but it'll already start like getting like specific. You, you'll see like very small partial quotes in there. Um, but order three looks like this. Scouts reported that they were on a shadowy sea, the high dim tops and broken pinnacles of old towers forlorn and dark. He turned to go back to his hole and stood for a moment filled with dread. Frodo became aware that it was not so, for a shapeless fear lived within the ruined walls. Nine lords there were, and after the first bottle, there was plenty of everything left for Frodo. Okay, and this is sentences, right? This is nice. It makes, it makes no sense, but this is sentences, and it's really nice. The last thing I did, and, and this was a suggestion of my brother, which I thought was insanely entertaining, so I, I decided to do this. Uh, absolutely no political commentary, just for the uh, statistical and amusing value of it. Um, I created a, a Trump speech of order to every poll with our jobs in Tanzania, never again. Only a, only a good to build a state of state and engage in the reverse. We'll all remember when I know that, right? Then John Kerry tried to be complex, but she was a 2017 defense program for a great, great detail. I have to say something. Interesting things to do, so more text, definitely. You can just take this same 27 lines, run them on a lot of things. Uh, uh, the amusement does not stop. Uh, it's actually quite interesting. Punctuation and things like that about how the text comes is interesting as well. And the one last thing that I'll say, what we did right now, we used the Markov model on words. So we remembered one or two or three words back at every point. Uh, we can do the same thing only on letters. So at every point, we'll decide what the next letter will be, including usually space as a letter and punctuation as a specific letter. Uh, and just remember, usually a little bit more, so it'll be three or four or five letters back. Uh, it gives completely different results. It's possibly even slightly more entertaining than, than this one because it creates words that sound like words but aren't really words. Uh, uh, but it actually creates really interesting results as well. So if you're playing around with this, I would definitely suggest trying both letters and words, seeing what, what different things you get from each one. You can do considerably higher order with letters, uh, uh, but it's letters, so you'll get less, less out of it in some ways. Uh, so that's also an interesting thing to try if you're doing that. Any questions? Yes? Did you try it on Hebrew? I didn't try it on Hebrew, simply because it was all in the, let's do everything, all the code in under 15 uh, minutes. Uh, and Hebrew is, just tends to possibly take everything to about five or 10 times as much work. So I didn't try it on Hebrew. Uh, there's no reason it doesn't work except for like Windows, right? So, so that's, that's pretty, much, pretty much the only thing. Uh, what would happen if you were to apply it to say like a randomly generated grammar structure or something like that? So, so follows now, follows join. So that would be really interesting. All right. So what would happen if I would, uh, that's nice, that's actually a common mistake that people do. I'll repeat the question. Uh, uh, what would happen if we would just apply some sort of uh, grammar into this? So I would in some way force it to use decent grammar. Um, so probably if you're going to that direction, you're also going to want to just drop this whole Markov chain idea and actually go to some algorithm that actually understands language. If I would enforce this on here, I would need to figure out how do I actually understand grammar from this text, and then use that. And, and at, that, at that point, I probably don't want to do Markov models at all. Uh, but it will probably be just as nonsensical, but would seem more like sentences. That would be my intuition. But I would probably just drop the Markov chain and just do something considerably more complex if I'm already understanding grammar. Yes? Relatedly, um, if you're trying to do, run this uh, exercise on a programming language, Oh, that's really interesting. I really should have done that. Um, what would happen if I would run this on like code, like on a programming language? What would that look like? That actually sounds really, really interesting. Um, do we have a place after this to just put in like the, the stuff that we have? Because I'd be happy to just run this. Yeah, so I'll, I'll run this and I'll put this either in the Facebook group or something. I'll just take code from somewhere. Uh, that sounds really interesting. I have no idea what that would look like, uh, but I'm actually really interesting. I'll have to see what I do about identation, but, but this is definitely something that's worth trying. I'll, I'll, I promise to do something in the next uh, day or two to, to get this up for you. This is really cool. Yes? 
Uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, uh, do you have a project in GitHub or somewhere that you can uh, look for the... For the code for this? So, so I don't have, but I'll put it in the group as well. Just put the, the code that I wrote in there. It's, it's, it's really, it's 27 lines, but I'll just put it there so you can copy and play around with it. That's definitely. Second question. Uh, is it fair to say that uh, every time you uh, um, take a larger uh, length of uh, words, you put it in the markup chain like you, uh, uh, like you explained, so every time you uh, make this number larger, so the, the creation of this piece will, will be more noticeable, or someone can maybe uh, notice it was like a muscle frost. Is it fair to say that if, uh, if you uh, take a larger uh, n number of words, people can, may notice it is a muscle frost or whatever you took? So, so, so the first question was, will you get access to the code? So yes, I'll, I'll put the code up. Second question is, about the, what happens when I put more input text in? How does that work? And generally, sorry? Uh, uh, the question is like, why, why three or four? Why not like five, six, or ten? Right. So the amount of input that I have, the more input I put in, the better the information the algorithm has to work with, and that's capped by my order. So if I have an order of one or two, it won't know what to do with more than some amount of information. As, as when I get enough information, that's pretty much gonna, gonna give me good enough probabilities, and then more information won't actually make a real difference. The higher I make the order, the more information I know what to do with. So if I have an order to, there is some point which there's no reason to enter more input, the difference will be negligible. Uh, but then if I want to increase the order, I need more information for that to make sense. So, so these two things have to sort of go up together. Uh, uh, there's no reason, like if you increase the order too much, then that just won't work and start quoting from the text. If you increase the input too much, then that's okay, but it'll just not be helping you as much. So just usually what you'll want to do is use as high order as possible, given the amount of input that you have. That's usually how you want to play around with them, uh, unless you're doing it for, for like laughs and then use lower orders, which is, which is funnier. Yes. You have some ballpark numbers on how, uh, how much uh, training text you need for a specific order? So do I have ballparks on how much text I need for a specific order? What I usually do, and I'll put that in with the code, uh, I have an extra function that isn't needed for this, which says, for every state possible, how many options do I have from that text to move? So at that point, just the average amount of options it can move at every point. So usually at that point, if the amount of options is one and a half or two, then you've easily got enough. If you've got 1.1 or 1.2, then it's generally pretty much okay, because usually the more common options will also have more options. So usually fine if you're 1.1 or 1.2. At the point where you're around 1.01 or 1.02, then you're probably already quoting parts from text. So there's a function that tells you that, and that, that makes it really easy to just ballpark if you're on the right track or not. Yes? So markup chains are simply a, a sliding window algorithm, or are there differences between so in our context, it really is just a sliding window algorithm. It's slightly more, like, more general than that in a lot of other, takes, other areas where you have a graph of states and you only remember some parts back. But it can be slightly more gen general. But in this case, it definitely is just a sliding window algorithm, absolutely. Do I have time for one more question? One, mo one more question. Yes. Um, where would you apply such techniques in what fields? So, Usually the best thing you want to do with these sort of things is you want to use Markov chains not to generate texts, but to tell whether a text was from a specific source. So say if we're talking about code, right, I could probably use Markov models to model specific, say, code in different languages and then look at a specific code and give it a score. How much does this look like Python code? How much does this look like another code? Or say, different types of machine code, right? I could probably tell them apart using scoring things with Markov chains. So usually in, real, in the real world, you're not that interested in creating text. Uh, I mean, at least not in the sort of things that we deal with. Um, but usually you'll want to sort of tell whether a text is from a given source. And that's something that's relatively easy to do with Markov models. You just need to give it a score instead of generate text, which is quite simple. Can actually identify a specific author if it was prolific enough? It probably should, but you will need a lot of, a lot of text. And it also kind of would depend on whether that author has like different 
either writing styles that may make it slightly more difficult, or maybe like authors have both poems and stories, and then they might look quite different. So it, it might be slightly more difficult than just running this script and scoring on it, but it definitely should. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have fun.